Welcome to the award-winning Thoughts from a Page podcast, a member of the Evergreen Podcasts Network, hosted by me, Cindy Burnett, a voracious reader and book columnist who provides you with casual author conversations, book recommendation episodes, and insider information on all of the newest releases that I have read and endorse, and on the publishing industry in my Behind the Scenes series. With so many books coming out weekly, it can be hard to decide what to read, so I find the best ones and share them with you. For more book recommendations or to find my backlist of interviews, visit my website at thoughtsfromapage.com. In 2023, I have a new segment on my Tuesday episodes called Read-Alike Requests. Listeners can submit a book they loved and tell me why they loved it, and I will suggest some similar reads. There is a Google form included in today's show notes if you would like to send in a request. If you love to read, I hope you'll consider joining my Patreon group to access additional content, including bonus episodes and early reads with prepub author chats. For March, there are two books, Colleen Oakley's new book, The Mostly True Story of Tanner and Louise, and Fifth Avenue Glamour Girl by Renee Rosen. And for April, my selection is The Comeback Summer by writing duo Allie Brady. The link to join is in the show notes. Today, I am chatting with C.J. Box about his latest Joe Pickett novel, Stormwatch. C.J. is the author of 22 Joe Pickett novels, eight standalone novels, and a story collection. He has won the Edgar, Anthony, McCavity, Gumshoe, and countless other awards. An avid outdoorsman, Box has hunted, fished, hiked, ridden, and skied throughout Wyoming and the Mountain West. He is an executive producer of ABC TV's Big Sky and Joe Pickett on Spectrum Originals and Paramount Plus, both of which are based on his novels. I hope you enjoy our conversation. And now for a quick break. For the last year, I have been focusing more on my health and eating habits. In connection with that, I have started drinking AG1 in the morning. When I started drinking AG1 daily, I could feel a real difference in my health and energy levels. That is because AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that supports your body's universal needs like gut optimization, stress management, and immune support. Since 2010, AG1 has led the future of foundational nutrition, continuously refining their formula to create a smarter, better way to elevate your baseline health. I recommend AG1 to all of my family and friends because the company has a team of doctors and scientists It is tested for 950 contaminants and is NSF certified for sport. It is formulated based on the latest science, and it maintains high quality standards. Thanks, AG1, for sponsoring my show. AG1 is a supplement I trust to provide the support my body needs daily. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash thoughts from a page. That's drinkag, the number one, dot com slash thoughts from a page. Check it out. And now back to my show. Welcome, CJ. How are you today? I'm fine. Thank you. I'm so glad you're here because I think I am probably your very biggest fan. My husband and I have read these books since the very first book came out. We never miss one. So I'm thrilled to pieces that we're getting to chat for the podcast. Wow. Thank you so much. That's very kind to say. Absolutely. So this is number 23. Is that right? Yes. As hard as that is for me to believe. Yes, it is. I know. I can't even imagine that as well. I feel like it's been a journey, but a very fun one. And they've all stayed so fresh and fun. And I just do adore Joe Pickett. Oh, thank you. Yeah. You know, I never... I never intended to write a long series. I never thought about it that way. Um, Way back when, when I wrote the first book, Open Season, to me, that was going to be a standalone. And it was about issues like Endangered Species Act and so on. And uh, as I was writing it, I found the best protagonist that would fit more, the most naturally into that story was a Wyoming game warden. Uh, Finally, when it was uh, accepted for publication by Penguin Putnam, they wanted two more books with Joe Pickett, and then that's how the series was born. I never sat around and thought, boy, you know, everybody's waiting for a Wyoming Game Warden series to last forever. Um, <laughs> but it's worked out well. Well, I think that people do love it because there aren't a lot of stories about Game Wardens, particularly Wyoming ones. But I think if you like nature and you like those types of events and issues, then it's the perfect series. Well, thank you. Yeah, there's now there's now a few Game Warden books out there, but Not too many, certainly not set in Wyoming. So before we talk about Stormwatch, I would love to talk a little bit about the TV show, Joe Pickett. My husband and I are both huge fans, as I mentioned, and we were a little nervous to see how the book would translate to the screen because that's always iffy. 
But Michael Dorman makes such a good Joe Pickett. And we had just come off of For All Mankind. So I was like, oh, this kind of took me a little bit to get used to him switching from Gordo to Joe. But I think he does a wonderful job. Did you have a say in his being selected? I did not. I did not have a say in the casting. But like you, I was a fan of his. Um, I watched him in an Amazon show called Patriot, that I thought he was great. And then we did watch For All Mankind as well. And when, when they cast him as Joe Pickett, I was absolutely thrilled because I was such a big fan. I think he's done a great job with it. And I've met him. He's from New Zealand. So when he speaks in his Kiwi accent, you kind of wonder where, where he gets that Joe Pickett drawl. But he loves the character. And you can tell. And he tries to embody the character. And I think he does a great job of it. I couldn't I can't think of anyone else. I never thought of an actor. I still don't when I write Joe Pickett, but I think he's about as good as you can get. I think that's exactly right. And I was a little bit worried after watching it that when I read the next book, I would really see him. But I think I've read the books for so long that I didn't. And it wouldn't matter if I did or didn't because I do like him. But it's kind of fun to have your own idea of the character as well. I agree. And one of the things that was pointed out to me that I didn't do deliberately and never thought about is that Joe Pickett is never actually described physically. There's only one description of him in the whole series of books that says he's of medium height and build. That's it. So whatever you think Joe Pickett looks like, that's what he looks like. I hadn't really thought about that either, but I definitely, after reading all these books, have in mind what I think he looks like. So I was hoping that would kind of stay with me. When will season two be out? It will be out. I I just now learned the date, but I'm sworn to secrecy. It'll be out in a few months. Okay, good. Well, that's not bad then. Exclusively on Paramount Plus. It turned out to be like their number three drama, um, even though they didn't get a huge amount of promotion. So I'm excited about season two, and especially after hearing which books and which storylines they're using. I think that's going to be really good. Okay, good. Well, I thought season one was really good, so I'm looking forward to season two. Well, let's turn our attention to Stormwatch. For those that won't have read it yet, could you give me a quick synopsis? Sure. It starts out with Joe Pickett, Wyoming Game Warden, part, a bad part of the job of any Game Warden. They have to take care of wounded wild animals. After a collision with a car, an elk, wounded elk, goes into the mountains. Joe Pickett follows in a snowstorm, and it leads him to a small kind of house trailer size high-tech facility in the middle of nowhere that he doesn't understand why it's there. And as he gets close, he finds a body outside that turns out to be the body of a University of Wyoming professor. So as he digs into this, everyone, including the governor, tells him to stop it. But the further he digs, the bigger it all gets. Um, There are several storylines going on at once. It's very, all takes place in a series of blizzards in Wyoming. And like I said, a few storylines going at once all kind of culminate in a big kind of godfather-like ending where everything is wrapped up. Well, and that's what you generally do is take several different storylines and then have them interweave and and eventually, as you said, culminate in a big ending. Have you always done that? I know in the more recent ones you have, but I can't think back to so long ago when I read Open Season. I think the majority of the books have been that, have had several, several things going. I think it's realistic because, you know, the cast is kind of extensive now. Um, Everybody has their own lives. It's fun to dip in and dip out of what everybody's doing. This book turns out to be more of a team effort kind of ensemble than any of the other previous books, where uh, everybody in Joe's world is involved in the end. And so that was a little complicated to do, but I think I'm happy with the result. But no, I I do like to have several things going on at once so that it's... Because these books are not just about who done it. You know, they're about issues and controversies and storylines and personalities and developing kids. And I think for me, it keeps it interesting to write. And hopefully for the readers, it's interesting to read. Well, often you focus on something related to Joe's job, something in the wild and nature, and then some kind of ripped from the headlines issue or something that's been happening in Wyoming or the surrounding area. Do you just keep an eye out on the news all the time and kind of jot down ideas as you see things develop? I do. But I also, I live in a real small community. We live on a ranch and I hear things, you know, at the, at the post office and at the grocery store and at the bar and what are people talking about locally that may not be in the newspaper or on the news. And 
I get a lot of information from just listening, overhearing. And I like to incorporate things like that into the books. You know, the, there's always kind of a little bit of a political element because there's so many federal agencies that run Wyoming and therefore they have their own agendas and law enforcement. And so there's always a conflict built in. And politics actually does affect how people uh, live on the ground in states with lots of public land because the leaders are appointed by Washington rather than elected by people. So, you know, it's always bubbling underneath the surface. There's a lot of different cross agendas. And you highlight how much public land there is in Wyoming in this book. And I can't off the top of my head remember, but it was a much larger number percentage wise than I expected. It's almost 50 percent. And when you consider that Wyoming is about the size of France, that's a lot of land. It is a lot of land. I was surprised by that. Most Western states are like that. Nevada, I think, is almost 75% federal. Wow, I had no idea. That's why I think when I tour and talk about these books outside of the West, um, I often get questions, especially from Eastern readers, going, is, that really, is it really like that? You know, from states where they have zero public land. Yes, because it is kind of hard to imagine, but also so many of those East Coast states are so much smaller. I mean, that's the other thing people always talk about that with Texas, how large it is. You know, you're up in the East Coast and you can drive eight hours and drive through six states. And in Texas, you could drive eight hours and still be in Texas. And I'm sure Wyoming's the same way. Yeah. And, and just, just to go to dinner sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> well, what's your favorite thing about Joe Pickett? Oh, you know, I think I, I, I admire his humbleness and doggedness. Over the years, when I say he's not ambitious, that makes him sound lazy. But I guess what he's not conniving. He's not trying to be the director of the game and fish department or the sheriff or the governor. He loves his job. He wants to do it as well as he can, dedicated completely to his job, his family, his community. And by doing those things that, you know, the kind of things everybody hopes they can do and be, he gets into all sorts of problems. But he's very dogged. He never drops things. And uh, I admire that. And he has such a great sense of right and wrong. Correct. Although sometimes he goes right up the line and a couple times he crosses it, he generally has a good sense of right and wrong. And that's why his interaction with Nate Romanowski is always interesting because Nate has his own sense of right and wrong. And Joe sometimes encourages that and is sometimes infuriated by it. Or wary of it. Yes. I love the quote on the front cover of Stormwatch by John Sanford that says, Joe Pickett is the one man you'd want by your side in a crisis. And I completely agree. Oh, well, that's, yeah, that's great. John's, I'm a big fan of John Sanford. And it turns out he's a big fan of mine. And we both share the same editor, Neil Nyron, who has retired. But part of his retirement was that he would continue to edit John and I. And um, I really like that relationship all the way around. And I, I was really grateful that he wrote that little quote. I liked that because I think that's exactly right. If you were going to pick any fictional character to stand by your side in a crisis, he'd be a good one. Although he does screw up sometimes and he's not a very good shot. <laughs> well, who doesn't screw up sometimes? <laughs> <laughs> well, where did the ideas come from for Stormwatch? There's a, there's a big thread about crypto mining in this book that sounds very weird for a game worn story. But the fact is, there are entrepreneurs have figured out that if they're, uh, one way to do crypto mining is to find old oil and gas wells and, and put a crypto mine, a little facility filled with computers running super hot on top of that well. Because what's not well understood is that crypto mining is very energy intensive, hugely energy intensive. So if they can have a, an independent source of energy, they can crypto mine more efficiently. And those things exist all over the place. And I, I saw the first one ever while I was elk hunting a few years ago. So I wanted to incorporate that into the book at some point, and it's finally come in. And then the other things in the books with the Nate Romanowski and the possible successionists and the governor are all just kind of naturally developed threads from earlier books. I was so interested in the crypto mining. It's still something that I swear I hear that term and I just sort of my whole brain shuts down because I think it's so confusing. But isn't it also that the computers run so hot? So to have them in some place like Wyoming where it's snowing and cold, that helps those computers stay a little cooler? You're exactly right. The, uh, the enemy of, of supercomputers is heat. So if they're in high elevations, uh, especially cold elevations, they operate more efficiently. 
Plus, there's always, you know, there's nothing illegal about crypto mining, but because the uh, equipment inside of it is so valuable, um, the people who own and put those facilities up are always scared somebody's going to break in and steal the computers and cart those, that equipment off somewhere else. So there is an element, a little bit of element of mystery and suspense where these things are located. I had no idea about any of that. And again, that's one of the things I always like about your book, because I feel like I learned something new each time that I just wasn't aware of. The one that has stuck with me forever, and I will not remember the title, but was the drones, where people were using the drones to move the elk or to, you know, kind of harass the elk. And I thought that was fascinating and sad. Yeah, that, I think that was from Wolfpack. And that is, that is a, a concern. You know, there's, a lot, there's been laws passed since then that make it illegal to basically harass wildlife from a drone, but it's still done. And the other thing you talk a little bit about in this book is the elk and their antlers. Yeah, it's called shed hunting. Uh, it's become a bigger and bigger thing. People have always collected old elk antlers because uh, elk shed their antlers annually. But antlers have become really valuable. Traders pay $25 a pound for them. And it, an average elk drops 80 pounds of antlers. So that can get kind of lucrative. And game wardens and other law enforcement are battling every year trying to keep people out of elk areas until the season starts so that they don't stress those animals and kill them trying to get their antlers. I thought that was really interesting and, again, sad. But I like that you highlight these issues. Well, I'm always fascinated by them. I learned of the, the method that's used in the book to harvest these antlers was when I learned from a local game warden, and he was in pursuit of the people he'd heard did that. Do you work decently close with the local game warden as you're creating each story to say, okay, would this happen to you, or how would you handle this? To, to some degree, yes. I've luck Luckily, we've got a great local game warden, a young guy who's very much like Joe Pickett. I have no doubt he would arrest me if I screwed up, but he's also very friendly, and I go on ride-alongs with him. And I always learn new things. There's always things going on. And to get their perspective on issues and new laws and cases that they're working on is fascinating. And I don't want any spoilers, but you have one other issue in the book. And I was so curious about it. And I can't really say a lot, but I was just wondering, once people read, they will understand it. Is that something that's happening that you tapped into in terms of the professor in the university and what he was doing? In just about every university in America, yes. Okay, well, this should really entice people to read your book. Because <laughs> I was like, uh-oh, especially in light of recent events with things in the sky and stuff. Right. I think we'll all hear more and more and more about that. Well, that was fascinating. Do you have a favorite of your books? Oh, <laughs> um, I'm always asked that and I never have a good answer. I'm still very fond of the very first one since it set basically you know, was the foundation for 23 books now that, and, th and there's nothing in it that I need to ever regret. And so I've, I'm fond of that. But Blue Heaven is one, is a standalone that I, I wrote that has nothing to do with Joe Pickett that won the Edgar Award that was very complex to write, but has hung in there all these years. So I like different books for different reasons. I'm sure they remind you of different time periods too. They do. Well, before we wrap up, what have you read recently that you would recommend to people? Well, because it's fresh of mind, I just finished uh, Michael Connolly's new book, Desert Star. And I thought it was, I'm a huge fan of Connolly. And I thought it was maybe the best of all of his Harry Bosch books. So I'm really high on that. It's really good. It's more poignant than anything he's ever written. So I'm a fan of that. I read pretty widely. I'm reading uh, uh, Napoleon by Andrew Roberts. And I'm learning a lot. It's like a, a, a part of my knowledge of, of uh, Western civilization is being filled in. And I always, always like that. And you mentioned Game Warden books. I know of Paul Dworin. Are there others? There was one set in Texas. I cannot remember the name of the author. Paul Dworin is, is probably the most prominent. And strangely enough, we have the same agent. So, uh, you know, she's representing uh, Maine Game Warden books and Wyoming Game Warden books. So th yeah, there's others. And there's, I think one thing I've noticed over the years is there's a lot more outdoor oriented books by new authors that I don't want to say that they, they're influenced by me, but I think it's part of the canon. And it shows that there's interest out there in off the beaten path kind of stuff. Tony Hillerman started it all. 
I just filled in and there's more and more all the time. There are, and I always gravitate to those stories. So I'm happy when I see another one. So I appreciate that you and Tony Hillerman contributed to that. And Tony Hillerman blurred my very first book, which meant a lot. Oh, I bet it did. And that has to be crazy to think back on your very first book now and you say you don't regret anything and that's great. But you wonder, like, do you look back and think, is there anything I put in this book that I shouldn't have because I had no idea I was going to be writing this many? Or has it just kind of stood the test of time and you're able to write around anything you might have included in there that you wouldn't have if you'd known it was going to be this long? Primarily, it has stood the test of time. There's little things in it. I, I re- recently reread the first book because the first season of Joe Pickett is primarily based on the first book. Right. And it'd been so long. And there are things in there, I think, with every author where you look at certain sentences or certain plot turns and you just cringe and think, <laughs> I wish I had that one back. But overall, I'm still pretty pleased with it. I think it could be a little tricky if you're not planning to write a series and then you, you know, you write a book and then you look back and think, oh, I wish I hadn't added this detail or made them from here or included this person. But I guess it's very easy to address those things as you keep writing. It is to some degree, but since we were talking about Michael Connolly, that's something, and that's something I've talked with him about, is his first book um, featuring Harry Bosch. Harry Bosch was a Vietnam vet. He was, you know, into his 40s, I think, at the time. And now in the series, Harry Bosch is really old. (laughs) And I know that, that Michael Connolly probably wishes he would have made him younger to start with. No, I know it's difficult because you don't think about those things because you're never thinking, I'm going to write all of these books. No. Well, thank you so much, CJ, for taking the time to talk to me today and coming on the Thoughts from a Page podcast. Well, thank you. You do a very good job of this. It's nice to, nice to talk to you again. I enjoy talking to you again as well. Hi, I'm Christina Yerling Biro, host of the podcast Pop Culture Confidential. Join me as I go way behind the scenes with some of the most influential people in entertainment and media. Hear actors such as Succession's Brian Cox talk about his favorite characters to play. There always has to be a mystery. The audience have to be in a situation where they want to know what's going on. Meet studio execs like Pixar chief Pete Docter and learn his secret on how he makes us cry. Emotion is our first language. And so many others who are defining popular culture, from Obama speechwriter David Litt to Top Chef host Padma Lakshmi. We don't often think about food politically or we don't want to, but it really is. Join me. Search for Pop Culture Confidential wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much for listening to my podcast. If you like this episode, and I hope you did, please follow me on Instagram at Thoughts From a Page. Consider joining my Patreon group to access bonus content and support the podcast. Tell all of your friends about the show and rate it or subscribe to it wherever you listen to your podcasts. I would really appreciate it. The book discussed in this episode can be purchased at my bookshop storefront, and the link is in the show notes. I hope you'll tune in next time. I'm Christina Yerling Biro, host of the podcast Pop Culture Confidential. Join me as I go way behind the scenes with some of the most influential people in entertainment and media. Hear actors such as Succession's Brian Cox talk about his favorite characters to play. There always has to be a mystery. The audience have to be in a situation where they want to know what's going on. Meet studio execs like Pixar chief Pete Docter and learn his secret on how he makes us cry. Emotion is our first language. And so many others who are defining popular culture, from Obama speechwriter David Litt to Top Chef host Padma Lakshmi. We don't often think about food politically or we don't want to, but it really is. Join me. Search for Pop Culture Confidential wherever you get your podcasts.